All right, so Vicky, shall we shall we go ahead and get started? Yeah, let's get started, Rob. All right, we'll do this. All right, people. Uh, so welcome to Fixing Faster with the Velocity Update in Shift Left Core. I'm Rob Lundy, Director of Product Marketing, and I'm joined today with our developer evangelist, Vicky Lee. Hi, nice to see y'all. And so today we're gonna to talk about all the new features in the Velocity Update. Um, but before we get to that, I'd like to provide uh, an introduction to Shift Left Core for those of you just getting to know the platform for the first time. So Shift Left Core is our application security platform that performs static analysis on vulnerabilities in custom code, CVEs and dependencies and secrets. And it does all of this in a single analysis, which is important for being able to show attackability in, open, in uh, custom code and open source findings. Uh, and it, it does this by performing a, a single scan. So it's not just a single pane of glass. It's not just a UI that takes feeds from different siloed tools. It's a unified analysis that's able to cross-reference custom and open source findings. It integrates easily into your CI CD so you can automate those early frequent and repeatable scans. It's software as a service and completely self-serve, so you can go to shiftleft.io slash register and sign up for a free account, and then you can set up uh, one of the demo apps that we have there that are available uh, and start, uh, start trying out the tool. And importantly, it does not send your source code to the cloud. So it, the, because of the way it scans, it creates an intermediary representation, and then it sends that representation for analysis. So feel free to go ahead and scan your own apps uh, with the tool. Now, I mentioned a word just a minute ago. Uh, the word was attackability, and it's a key concept in Shift Left Core, and it's something I'm gonna talk about again. So it's worth taking a moment to define that uh, clearly. So attackable is short for attacker reachable. So it's a kind of reachability but in the sense that attackable and reachable are used uh, in AppSec, attackable goes further to prove risk. So reachability as a concept is used in technical fields like uh, networking or graph analysis. In networking, if you're asking whether or not one device is reachable by another device, you're basically asking if the one device can communicate with that other device. If that's the case, then that device is reachable. When it's used in AppSec, we're typically referring to the open source dependencies. So when a vendor says that they can tell whether or not an open source dependency is reachable, typically what they're saying is whether or not that dependency is reachable by the application, or can we see a call graph between the application and that dependency? So that's the first step. That, that basically tells us whether or not the application is actually using the dependency, um, but it, it doesn't answer the question that we're asking and it doesn't answer the question that we need an answer to. So as AppSec, what we need to know is whether or not that dependency and the CVEs, the known vulnerabilities within that dependency, whether or not they actually pose a risk to our application. And that's where attacker reachability comes in. With attacker reachability, we're asking whether or not an attacker working from the surface of the application is able to reach the vulnerabilities in that dependency. In other words, can we see the evidence of a path through the code or a data flow that shows that a malicious user can send information through the application in order to test, discover, and then exploit the, the known vulnerabilities in that dependency? And so that's where attacker reachability comes in. And in order to be able to see this, you need to, your, the tool needs to have a holistic view of custom code and, and open source dependencies. And this is something that Shift Left Core excels at. And an added kicker, the reason we're, we're spending time talking about this, is that it turns out of all the CVEs that a software composition analysis scan sends your way, in a typical application, only a small percentage of them are actually reachable to attackers. Uh, so it's typically we've seen among our customers less than 10%. It's, it's actually a good deal less than 10%. It's more around 5%. Um, so it turns out that when developers are using open source in building applications, they're not making all those inputs available to just anybody who comes in and uses the application. 
uh, developers are sanitizing paths that reach those dependencies. And in some cases, those paths are, the dependencies are accepting inputs that are trusted and completely internal to the application. But to see that, you need to be able to see the code. And so why is a company named Shift Left talking so much about attackability? Well, it's because DevSecOps is about the right information reaching the right people at the right time. So with attackability, your devs see custom code and open source findings in the context of their code. They see those findings while that code is still fresh in their mind. Your AppSec team is dealing with a lot fewer of false positives, and they're getting that continuous and early awareness of risk as it's getting ready to merge with your main branch. And if you're in DevOps, this is the kind of automation and tooling that you're looking for. When the right information reaches team members at a time that they can act on it, that's when that kind of uh, productivity flywheel starts moving, where the process can kind of motivate itself. And this is how application security as a process can go from, be, from being that late, slow, out of band blocker to being an integrated part of DevOps. It's that holistic view of modern code getting to your AppSec and your devs as early as every pull request while the code is still fresh in your devs' minds so they can make those fixes more efficiently. So that's shift left core. So now we're gonna take a look at how the velocity update improves that entire experience with shift left core. We're gonna talk about the improved UI and workflows uh, and that will include the application management, how you, how you manage all the applications that the platform is monitoring. Uh, the application summary, which is where you see all the scans for a particular application. Uh, then we're going to take a, look, take a look at the findings themselves and how that view has been uh, updated. And then we're going to look at some languages that have expanded coverage in uh, the Velocity update, and that's intelligent software composition analysis support for Python and Go. And then for the first time, Shift Left Core is um, can can analyze mobile applications, and this is with uh, Kotlin in the Velocity update. And then after that, we're gonna take a look at some really cool automation tools that are great for uh, getting this process working across teams. And Vicky's gonna take us uh, on a tour of Build Rules version two, as well as interactive remediation. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and let's hop into the tool. So uh, can you see my screen, Vicky? Is it... Yes, I can see your screen. Oh, wow. Okay, good. So we're looking at the tool then. Uh, so we're we're here in the dashboard, and this is the app screen. This is where we see all the applications that the platform is monitoring. In the Velocity update, we've made it easier for multiple teams to manage multiple applications. So now you can search for applications or search by repo. Uh, you can filter on languages. You can sort by, by criticality. You can sort by attacker reachable open source uh, vulnerabilities can sort by scan date. We've also added the ability to create app groups. So for instance, here, I'll go ahead and create an app group with the languages that have uh, increased support in the, up, in the Velocity update, and that'll be Go, uh, Python, and Kotlin. Let's see, and I'll just call it, let's see, call it Velocity update, and we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll return to that later. Uh, but sometimes it's not an application that you're looking for. And we were kind of reminded of this with log four shell. Sometimes you've got a dependency and you want to find where it is across all of your applications. Well, that's now very easy to do. It's as easy as going up to reporting, uh, going to dependencies. And we'll go ahead and yeah, we'll search for log four J. And then here we see all the related CVEs we see the packages and their version numbers, and we see the affected applications. So, so pretty easy to, to identify across our applications. And so this is how application management has been improved in the Velocity update. Now let's take a look at a particular app and the app summary. So I'll just take a look at our Java demo app, which you can play with if you create an account and uh, try out the tool. Uh, and here in this view, uh, one of the things that's been added is it's easier to select the branch. So if you have multiple teams working on the same application, it's easier for them to get to the scans that relate to their work. 
We've also added a lot of telemetry under scan details. It makes it easier to debug. And uh, when you're integrating this in your CI CD, it's easier to check and make sure you're getting the scans that you're expecting from your automation. And now let's look at a finding. So we'll just go in here. We'll take a look at a critical finding here, just at the top. And so here we see that the data flow has been updated. So it's it's easier to identify the source and sync. So the source is where untrusted data comes into the application. And the sync is where it's used by the application. Uh, developers in AppSec can now uh, easily expand and collapse parts of the data flow. So it's, it's just a lot easier to look at these and scan through these. Uh, and we've updated the descriptions. So there's a lot more information brought forward for the developer who's going in to understand the vulnerability and to remediate it. And Vicky was actually a big part of getting this information into the tool. Uh, Vicky, do you want to talk to us about the expanded uh, descriptions? Yeah, I love to. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, so a big part of our jobs here at Shift Left is to make sure that um, the developers and the application security people who use Shift Left have an easier time fixing vulnerabilities and making their applications more secure, right? And a big, big part of that is making sure that once the vulnerability is found, the developers that are using Shift Left actually has the resources to get those vulnerability fixed as soon as possible and as effectively as possible. So before this velocity update, Shift Left's vulnerability descriptions work um, the same way as a lot of other vendors' uh, vulnerability descriptions, right? Where the descriptions are just simply the name of the vulnerability that was found, maybe um, some kind of severity rating, and um, like a short description of what the vulnerability is and what could be the causes of the vulnerability, right? Um, and what we did here with this update is that um, we wanted to make sure that when a um, vulnerability is found, the developer can get up-to-date um, advice on how exactly they can remediate the issue. Because mm -hmm. uh, So previously, with the previous descriptions, um, when a developer looks at that description, what would they have to do in order to actually fix that issue in code, right? So they have several options. Um, one of them, and the most common of these options, is that they would go on the internet, they go to Reddit, they go to Stack Overflow to look for potential um, like code that they can um, see as examples of fixes to their own code. And they could also read like the um, documentation or other kinds of generic remediation advice that are available on the internet. And a lot of the times these advice or these code samples, um, they might not be um, effective in fixing the vulnerability, right? They might include out of date um, best practices or code that was written a long time ago that don't really um, fit the uh, developer's need. And mm -hmm. another scenario that might happen is that you might find remediation advice that is not suitable to your application environment. So let's say that you are a Java developer. Um, you might find something that tells you how to fix a vulnerability in Python, um, but not in Java, right? Then you would have a very hard time actually translating that kind of generic advice to your own situation. So what we did here is that um, we integrated language-specific remediation advice that includes code samples so that developers when a vulnerability is found in their code, they will be able to just go to Shift Labs portal, look at um, their uh, respective language tab, and they can find um, remediation advice that, are, that is up to date, that, uh, that fixes the vulnerability properly, and some sample code um, for their language. So mm -hmm. if you're a Java developer, you can go into the Java tab like this one and look at um, what is a safe way in Java in order to implement this functionality that would not lead to a sensitive data leak. And we also included code samples specific to the developer's language that showcases a vulnerable example. And that is very, very valuable because that will show developers oh, this is exactly what leads to this specific kind of vulnerability, and this is what I want to avoid in the future. Mm, very cool. 
Got it. So trusted information, a lot more of it right up front, saves people time and also saves them, I guess, from pitfalls of uh, moving mm -hmm. forward on the wrong information. Yeah, exactly. That has been a huge issue, especially since um, like the most trusted resource for developers is probably Stack Overflow, right? But it's also infamous for um, for giving out bad advice, outdated advice that developers should not really be copy pasting from. And another thing um, that uh, this um, sort of new interface really helps with is that when developers go onto these third party sites to look for vulnerability advice or remediation advice, um, that introduces an additional context switch in the developer's workflow, right? Which can be very, very time consuming. Um, developers can find, they can, can spend hours really going on, going through like online resources and not finding a, a single thing that are useful to them. So this um, updated remediation advice will really help with that. Got it. Very cool. Cool. Thanks, Vicky. Um, sure, no problem. Cool. And and so here, I'll also note, we're taking a look at a custom code vulnerability. So let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at a an attacker reachable uh, open source vulnerability. Uh, let's go back and actually let's take a look at one of the languages that have received uh, enhanced support under, um, under the Velocity update. So uh, both Python and Go have uh, gotten support for uh, intelligent software composition analysis. And so we'll go into Python. This is our, our Python demo. Go ahead and take a look at open source vulnerabilities. And here we see uh, we have four in this app. And we'll go ahead and look for attacker reachable. And we see that only one is attacker reachable. And this is how an open source vulnerability appears in uh, shift left core with the update. So here we see the CVE number and we see the associated risk score. And here I can see that the issue is in Flask. Uh, and so it's likely that this package is going to be upgraded, but it's a question of when. So I don't, it may not be this sprint, it could be next quarter. But looking at this vulnerability, I see that it's attacker reachable in one finding. Uh, and so this is strong evidence. This the the data flow that shows it's it's attackable is strong evidence that a malicious user will be able to find and exploit this vulnerability while it's out in the field. Um, so I would like to get this information in front of the developers to make my case for an upgrade. So as as AppSec, we would reach out to our developer team and I'd say, Hey, Vicky. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the recent scan, but there was, an, there was a vulnerability in Flask. I would like to talk to you about it. Have you had a chance to look at it? Mm -hmm. So I think as a developer, when I look at a data flow like this, I can very clearly see that. Um, so the source of the vulnerability is um, on the search route. And that means that developers will be, a, uh, attackers actually will be able to attack this vulnerability through the slash search route and through the ver a variable called query param. So if they, and this is a cross-site scripting vulnerability, that means that if they um, submit cross-site scripting payloads to the query parameter um, through the search route, they will be able to exploit this cross-site uh, cross scripting vulnerability in the application. That means that this vulnerability is very, very simple to exploit. And it's it's evidence that it's likely to be exploited in the wild if we leave it unfixed. So that means that um, I will have like a much more concrete understanding of what the vulnerability can mean for the security of my users, for the security of my organization and my application. And that will help me sort of prioritize um, my vulnerability fixes accordingly. Great, and so and so there there it happened. So so Dev is is more on board, uh, and that happens when the right information is available and it's visible to everybody. So when 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 teams can see the same piece of information and it's good information, they start building trust in the process, and when trust is established, that's when teams start moving faster, uh, and that's how you shift fixes left. Which is which is what we're trying to do here at uh, at Shift Left, uh, and 
just to uh, wrap up this part, let's go ahead and take a look at the other language that uh, has expanded support in the Velocity update. Uh, let's see, and that is Kotlin. Uh, so here, for the first time, Shift Left is analyzing mobile applications. And so for the first time, we have a vulnerability category uh, for Android. And just clicking through, we can see that mobile developers get the same UI, the same workflow uh, as they do for any other language that's managed by Shift Left Core. Uh, Kotlin is in preview, but if you create an account, there is a demo app in there and you can start playing with the, with the tool uh, today. So here we've, we've seen the different views for managing apps, for managing applications, and for going through findings, as well as some of the new language support that we have. Uh, we've seen how the velocity update improves the experience through Shift Left Core, and we see how it makes easier, make it e easier for teams to benefit from attackability. But key to DevSecOps is putting all of this in motion. You know, does the information arrive on time? Is it transparent? Is it flexible enough that the multiple stakeholders, devs and AppSec, can be part of the process? And does it make it easier to make fixes faster? Uh, and so there are two more features uh, that are really cool that are part of the Velocity update, and that's Build Rules version 2 and interactive remediation. And uh, Vicky is going to demonstrate these for us from the de developer perspective. So, uh, Vicky, I will go ahead and I will pass the ball to you. Yeah, so yeah. one of the very exciting features that I want to talk to you about in this update is the updates to our build rules feature. And what build rules basically is, is that um, it's basically a way for either application security people or developers to set up a set of rules that um, are security related that would um, break a developer's build if needed. So with build roles, we can say things like if you find any critical vulnerabilities or any SQL injections, then we're going to ask the developers to go back, fix their code, and then submit their code again. And Got so it. how it works is that um, basically, let's say that I'm a developer and I make some changes to the code. And then what I would do basically after I'm done with my changes is that I would submit a pull request, right, um, to um, make my code um, submitted um, to be merged with the main application. And at this point, what we can do with build rules is that we can set up automatic scans with shift left and to see if um, the developer's code actually meets our standards and could be accepted um, as a submission. So let's take a look here at, um, let's take a look at actually the configuration files that we need in order to set up build rules. So here um, you can see an example of the build rules file that we're using. Here we are setting up two rules that would break the developer's build. The first one is called allow no criticals. And this rule basically says that um, for all the uh, for all the findings that are found in um, our custom code, so the finding types is called vulnerability and set of secrets or open source security issues. And if we find any critical vulnerabilities, and we're going to allow zero of these vulnerability. So this rule basically says that we're going to allow zero of new critical uh, custom code vulnerabilities in the developer's code. If they do not meet this criteria, then we're going to break their build. Mm -hmm. And then the next and, rule and that here. Was available, and that, that part was actually around in build rules version one, right? You could, you could do yes. that. Got it. Okay. Yes. So the main difference with um, build rule version one and version two is what I'm about to address actually is the ability to include reachable or unreachable open source vulnerabilities in the build rules. Attacker, so the second rule here, sorry. you can attacker. Yes, reachable. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you can see here that this rule says that we're going to allow only 10 um, mm -hmm. reachable open source vulnerabilities. So that means that, um, as Rob just said, we're allowing only 10 attacker reachable vulnerabilities in this particular um, in this particular scan. And that means that we're only going to allow 10 open source vulnerabilities where the attackers can find a path in code 
to exploit the vulnerability. And so when a developer submits a pull request, you can see here that um, the pull request that I just ran with these build rules actually failed. Um, and that's because here you can see the results of the analysis, and this will inform the developer as well why their build has failed and which uh, vulnerability was found in their code. And so, so you can is, see here. This is yeah. transparent, right? Any, anybody who has access to the pull request can go in, they'll see the report, and then they also have access to the config file. So everybody can see the rules that are being set. It's not a light decision to break a build, but if you're going to set it up, you do it through automation, right? Where people, where it's, the tool mm -hmm. is the intermediary between the teams. Yeah, exactly. So this way um, it's fully automated and it provides the dev with enough transparency to see uh, this is exactly why we're rejecting your code and this is what exactly what you need to fix. So here you can see that it will outline exactly which rules um, that you broke and also um, the findings that were found that violates this rule. So you can see that it shows like the first five findings of critical vulnerability in the developer's custom code. And it also shows you like which, what um, the number of different vulnerabilities that were found, like how many of them are sensitive data leaks, how many of them were deserializations. This will show the developer um, like sort of what direction they need to go um, in order to start remediating and fixing the issues in their code. Okay. Right. So here, from here, you can sort of go into the different scan results if you want to look at the data flow of the vulnerability and to obtain more details about the scan results. Cool. And so, yeah, let's go into one of the scan results here. And when you go into the ShiftLab portal after um, you run that scan, you will see the new scan show up here. And from there, you can go into sort of um, the different details of the vulnerabilities, you know, and see more in detail, like the statistics of what kind of vulnerability was found in this particular scan of the application. Mm -hmm. And so and let's go into. App, so, and it's a demo app. So we are, these demo apps are showing off the vulnerabilities you can find. You shouldn't, you don't be too alarmed by what you see, right? Yeah, so this is a demo app with many, many different vulnerabilities. It's actually a bait app that, that was implanted uh, intentionally with different types of vulnerabilities so that we can see what the scan results look like for um, different types of vulnerabilities, including like open source of vulnerabilities or custom code vulnerabilities or hard coded secrets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's go into one of these vulnerabilities that we just found. We see that there are, you know, three uh, deserialization uh, vulnerabilities, for example, and all three are uh, of critical severity. So even just one of these found in the developer's code would mean that the, the build is blocked, basically. Mm -hmm. And as usual, if we go into one of these vulnerabilities in detail, we can see like the data flow of things and to really see how the vulnerability actually manifests in this developer's custom code. Okay. And so let's um, let's go into like another feature of this particular update. And let's say that um, I'm a developer and I know that the um, this uh, deserialization vulnerability is actually a false positive because I have implemented a custom method that would deal with the um, serialized input safely. And let's say that that method is called isAdmin. So this is like an example that I'm using for this webinar. Uh, isAdmin doesn't actually deal with serialized input safely, but let's just take it um, as an example. So let's say that a developer, I have um, created a method that will um, remediate a specific vulnerability, like let's say that it will deal with input safely. It will perform some kind of input sanitization, output encoding that will render the vulnerability um, unattackable by attackers. Um, then how do I inform the shift up engine um, that this method will remediate the vulnerability, right? And that is another thing that I want to talk about um, in this update is a 
It's called, um, it's, it's a functionality called interactive remediation. So what interactive remediation basically does is that it allows developers this kind of flexibility um, to suppress findings in their scans according to um, their custom remediation code. Got it. So it so sounds like, uh, so I just yeah. want to check for, for uh, mm -hmm. what I'm hearing. It sounds like you're saying uh, the, the, the tool ran a scan and it sees all the methods that you're using, but you as the developer have deeper knowledge of what's going on in those methods. And so the mm -hmm. tool saw that this path, it saw this path as vulnerable, but you as a developer know that there is something that you've created custom in one of those methods that is in fact sanitizing that path. Mm -hmm. So right? remediate, yeah, exactly. Like fixing vulnerabilities sometimes could be quite complicated, right? And a lot of the times we have to um, write some custom code or or um, fix a vulnerability in a way that is suitable for our um, own application, and that could may mean very different things from um, application to application and from organization to organization. So ShiftLab might not be able to pick up on those, especially if you're implementing a custom um, custom remediation function that is not part of a standardized um, sanitization um, library or something like that. So that's when this functionality comes into play. You can tell ShiftLab this, um, this specific method or this specific part of the data flow actually means that this finding is a false positive. Okay, cool. I think a good way to take a look at it is to look at the um, configuration files that you would need in order to use this functionality. So let's jump into one of those. Okay. So here I have um, open is a remediation file that would set up this specific uh, functionality. And here you can say that we here we say that if um, the data flow passes through a method with is admin in its name and its vulnerability category is deserialization, then this means that the um, finding should be suppressed because it's not an actual vulnerability. Mm. And then what we can do um, before we um, actually run the scan with this specific remediation file is that we can perform a dry run um, using SL remediation dry run just to make sure that um, we know exactly what kind of findings will be suppressed and we know that our remediation configuration file is working properly. Okay. Right, so let's just run this. Okay. And so this, uh, the output of this command is actually here. And here you can see that we found three findings that fix, uh, that fit, fits our criteria. Basically, there are three deserialization vulnerability that passes through the method with the name is admin in it. So these three findings will be suppressed in any scan that has been ran with this remediation configuration file. Uh, and so and we're not actually gonna, yeah. As, and, but uh, AppSec can see this. So, so you as a developer are able to set this up to account for your code, but AppSec still also has control over the process. They could see what you're suppressing and they can see what effect it has and they can also roll it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So this uh, remediation.yaml file is basically just a YAML file, right? I can, um, I'm not currently doing it, but you can basically put it anywhere. And it's the, the like the format is very standardized. So you mm -hmm. can, what you can do is that you can put it in version control and you can make it very transparent to your developers and apps like, right? These are exactly the um, remediation rules that we're using, and if there is a need to um, to audit it, um, you can audit it. It's very transparent, and you can audit the changes to the file as files as well. And another thing is that um, so every scan that you run with these remediation files, um, as as long as as soon as you remove the remediation files the scan will just go back to the baseline scan. The shift of course is still gonna find everything. So if you have um, 
a reason to make changes to the remediation file or um, sort of uh, revert the changes, then mm -hmm. you have a way to do that as well. You will simply update the remediation file and then run rerun the scan. Um, nothing from previous um, scans will be carried over to the new remediation rules. Okay, very cool. Yeah, so I think we're not gonna go and we're not gonna actually perform a scan at this point. It will take a few minutes. So let's just take a look at um, one of the examples of previous scans that I've ran with this remediation file. So this scan right here, you can see that instead of the regular 102 vulnerabilities that are found with this particular demo um, application, we found just 103. And that's because here you can see that we actually invoke the we invoke the actual scan with the remediation.yaml file, which is the file that I just showed you. And because of that, the three deserialization vulnerabilities that we found were actually suppressed. And we actually just found 99 vulnerabilities in this particular application this time. And there are 23, 27 critical vulnerabilities because three of them were the deserialization vulnerabilities that were suppressed. So here you can see how the remediation file actually um, sort of updates our scan results and mm -hmm. make our scan um, a more custom to the developer's workflow and um, custom remediation code. Got it. Great. Yeah, that's another way for the teams to interact with the scans and and make sure they're closely tracking the actual uh, security posture of their of their application. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Nice. So, is that it? Should we take some Should we take some questions, or do you have more more to show us on? Yeah. So that is um, the demo I have for you guys. Um, we're happy to welcome any questions that you have about about chip left, about how the technology works, or about the new updates regarding the velocity uh, an update. Yeah. yeah. And so and and here's a here's a good one that we'll definitely want to talk about. So it's um, uh, do we just have to use the UI, or are there other ways to use the tool? Uh, and so I guess uh, before we answer this, so the answer is yes there are other ways and uh if you stay tuned uh let's see if you stay tuned we're going to have uh, our product team is actually going to be sharing a sneak peek at some things that they're developing in the future um, but right now in addition to the ui we have uh there's api and there's cli and uh vicky i know you you particularly like the uh, cli over the over the ui yeah so specifically what i like about the cli is um, how repeatable every scan is, right? So if you're using something with uh, a GUI, then if you want to replicate a finding or you, if you want to show other people how to um, execute a specific scan or how to use a specific um, remediation file or specific steps that will change the, one, uh, change the scan in some way, then you have to outline all of those steps, right? Whereas with the CLI, everything is very convenient. It's all invoked via different command-like options. And you can just very tightly um, package everything up in uh, within a single command, right? So that's what I really like about the CLI is that if you need debugging help, if you um, want to try out something that someone else is running, then you have a really nice, clean, and easy way to do that. And But it, it, it all depends on preferences, I think. Um, if you want to use a CLI, you can. Um, but if you are more comfortable with the GUI, um, there's a way of staying within that environment as well. Got it. Cool. All right. Here's uh, So another question is, uh, why is attackability valuable if we're still just upgrading the packages anyway? Um, yeah, so that's that's a great question. So if you're if you're still performing upgrades to remediate, uh, you know, part of it there that we saw in our example, you know, I think is is uh, it gives you added proof to understand how to prioritize work. So, you know, again, if 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 it's a if you're uh, scheduling the upgrade for security reasons, you want you want to be able to show that the outcome is actually going to have a security benefit for the application. You're going to want to see that it will actually reduce the risk in your application. And that's what attackability provides you. Without that, you, you don't have that evidence. And, and, it, and it turns out you have a much longer list of packages that you need to uh, upgrade. 
Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Vicki? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point, Rob. I think um, we all like to see evidences of why we should do the work and why we should actually spend any time or effort on something, right? And also another thing is that um, sometimes it's just impossible to update a package, right? Um, we, we hope that doesn't happen most of the time, but sometimes it does happen. Sometimes um, we are using software that is no longer supported and no patch what is um, provided by the vendors or um, we are working with a vendor that provides patches slowly, mm. or um, it's simply that the package is integrated too deeply into our systems that um, fixing would not make any economical sense. Then in that case, um, we could take a look at the reachability of the vulnerability, take a look at exact, uh, specifically the data flow and the path that the attacker's uh, input can reach the vulnerability, and we can figure out some way to fix a vulnerability in another way that doesn't involve uprooting, right? We can take a look at the data flow and we can say, so this is where um, the attacker is getting into the application. So how about that sanitize that input location or let's um, implement some other kind of mitigation around that data flow um, so that we can make sure that our risk is reduced without upgrading the package directly. Got it. Okay. So if you can't upgrade the package, then you can uh, implement a fix and do it uh, and rescan to see if you can at least make it no, so that's no longer reachable to the attacker. Yeah, basically. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. Very cool. Um, cool. Uh, so next question, uh, can we scan, okay, can we scan Kotlin web apps? Uh, so so right now the threat models are tuned for mobile apps. So we, we recommend you scan uh, mobile apps. Um, let's see, you said, uh, you said a single scan covers uh, custom code, uh, open source and secrets. So then uh, why doesn't Kotlin have ISCA? ISCA? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, so what intelligent software composition analysis, what ISCA in shift left core uh, does is that adds the ability to map CVEs to dependencies. So every scan uh, of every of every language uh, does track, does follow the code going in and out of dependencies. It sees the dependencies. And that's the case with Kotlin right now. And that's technically that technologically that's that's the heavy lift. That's that's the hard work. Um, adding ISEA to map those CVEs is uh, relatively trivial, uh, and that will follow. That will inevitably, inevitably follow uh, within just a few months. Um, so, so Kotlin will get ISEA uh, soon, but right now it is tracking through dependencies. Um, so next question, uh, can you see, oh, can you see attackability across microservices? Okay, so, so that's a good question. Uh, that's also an advanced question. Um, and the answer is, is yes, you can create, uh, so you can, you can create an app group uh, with those different services, and then you, you can use advanced policies to track uh, data flows across the services. Uh, and if you have more questions about that, definitely uh, reach out to us. We'd, we'd be happy to talk to you. And I think, I think that's it for the questions. So uh, unless there are any more, I'll just say uh, it was great talking to you guys. Uh, definitely hope you check us out. Either if you want to see the tool for yourself in, in action, go to shiftleft.io slash register and create a free account. There are demo apps in there for, in different languages that you can set up and start playing with. Or again, we never send your source code to the cloud, so feel free to test one of your apps. Uh, or if you want to start talking to us, just go to shiftleft.io and just uh, reach out to us. Figure, you know, <laughs> start talking to us. We're happy to talk. All right. Well, Vicky, it was good talking with you. Yeah. So same here. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. It's very good talking to you, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.